Welcome to the Mocking Cast, the podcast of Mockingbird Ministries. I'm David Zoll, your host, and in just a few moments, I'll be joined by my co hosts, Sarah Condon and RJ Heyman. We come to you every week to explore a few of the places where we currently see grace and its absence playing out in unexpected and compelling ways. We are glad to have you with us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, what are your favorite bits of corona humor so far? Is that mm-hmm. is that sacrilegious to ask? What are your favorite memes or headlines? Uh, that have made you laugh during this time. I'll give you a couple of mine, and then I want to hear from you. McSweeney's did a uh, list of humble brags you can do during a plague. Like, uh, didn't even know you could get promoted while working from home. (laughs) (laughs) Or or wife's prayer for her husband to stop watching sports all the time results in a global pandemic. I had that thought. There's another one. uh, You know, Michael Knight, a 29-year-old musician, said... uh, Uh, memed, uh, they said a mask and gloves were enough to go to the grocery store. They lied. Everyone else had clothes on. (laughs) That one was good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What do you guys got? What do you guys got for me, for our audience? Yeah, you stole mine. Joke That's wise. good. That's a good one. I mean, our Eric Thomas, if you guys don't read, it's um, his, his column in L uh, online is called uh, Eric Reads the News. It's very funny all the time, but it's especially funny right now. And um, he has a piece up I love called What to Do If Everyone is Zooming Without You. And it's full of, I mean, it's it's almost hard to read out loud. It's so funny. But he has this, um, this one bit I wanted to read. Uh, Should I organize a Zoom happy hour? And he says, literally do whatever you want. <laughs> organize a virtual event make up capricious rules, <laughs> set a dress code, mute everyone, and sing the entirety of Cats. We're under digital martial law. That's the thing where you act like it's Black Friday at Marshall's. <laughs> one, <laughs> one of the things I'm finding most successful is randomly sending celebrities the Zoom access codes for online events. I know they're not busy, just sitting in their mansions, learning the words to imagine They'll welcome the distraction. So if you've been wishing you could stare into a video screen and chat with little Richard, now is your chance. (laughs) It's very funny. I love it. RJ, anything else you got to share? I just think, and this is a little bit my own thing as well, but just children, just seeing children everywhere and seeing people like adults engage with their children in like wonderful, unexpected, chaotic, funny ways, you know, whether it's like... um, Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show or, you know, in my house, Marshall just could not be happier. He is Mm -hmm. just so happy to have everyone home and available and we're playing. Yeah. And it's just like nonstop party time. And beyond that, I'm not a huge one for um, meme culture because I'm old. Uh, But the whole world just feels like a meme. Like one of our computers broke down and I had to take it to like a micro center because all the Apple stores are shut down. And just Mm -hmm. like seeing people standing in line, you know, six feet apart or getting takeout at a restaurant in like a deserted, you know, part of town that usually is bustling with, it's just, it's crazy. It's just, it's the, the, it's weird living in the midst of something that is only in movies. Mm. Um, And just to have conversations with people. Also, obviously to see all the people walking outside. I did see a good meme where it had one picture of a family. It said, you know, before coronavirus and like everyone's on their individual phone or iPad. And then the next picture is after coronavirus and they're all taking a walk together outside, you know, or during um, quarantine, everyone, all of a sudden the law comes in and, and all it's like you dying to get do outside. Is go outside. Yeah. Yes. My, my wife is like, are there usually this many people outside? Like it's kind of crazy. And it's crazy. And everyone, yeah. And everyone's keeping their quote unquote distance. Um, but it also sort of feels like a more social time, um, at least with people that, live right around you. So I just can't believe we're living through this. It's, it's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. We took our kids to the church's playground, which is one of the perks of being a clergy family, right? As we have keys to a playground. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a school there, so it's a nice playground. And so we, we, I took the kids up there and 
obviously like the gates locked and people kept coming up and being like, can we come in? And I was like, we're <laughs> in a zombie movie right now. Okay, like, this is so <laughs> creepy. Cause I was like, no, you can't, you know, <laughs> like good. And luck you were holding a bat. You're eaters. holding a bat just in case. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there will be, I mean, I, I, we're going to come back to humor. It feels like the last <sighs> week there was sort of a tipping point in terms of maybe before things get as bad as they're going to get, people have really, really amped up the the jokes. And, uh, you know, I think the first thing I saw was when Andy Crouch tweeted, like, had not planned on giving up quite this much for Lent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very you know, that's and, then, good. and then you have Neil, Neil Diamond doing Sweet Caroline about hands, washing hands. You know, it's kind of, everyone's got, my personal favorite is anything to do with Alan Partridge and washing hands. I just, I, I just fall to tears. Um, but I, you know, writing in, in Time Magazine did a, did a. There's some articles that have come out about what, what is this humorous uh, instinct or impulse reflex that we're uh, seeing uh, playing out right now in America. And well, one comedian, Erica Rhodes, was quoted as saying, "Laughter is a symbol of hope and becomes mm-hmm. one of our greatest needs in life, right up there with toilet paper." And, of course, while humor can helpfully lighten things up, too much laughter and flippancy can signal a person is trying to escape from reality. And to that, you just say, well, you know, why on earth wouldn't we want to escape from reality a little bit? Uh, but breaking the tension by posting memes, I think, is, uh, has, been a, has been one of the many uh, kind of, I don't know, bright sides of this uh, very, you know, scary fiasco. But let's 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 go from the from the humorous into the slightly more serious. The Harvard Business Review uh, had an interview with David Kessler, who's the world's sort of foremost expert on grief. Worked with Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who many people know. Um, and the title of the interview was "That Discomfort You're Feeling Is Grief." The Business Review said, uh, "People are feeling any number of things right now. Is it right to call some of what they're feeling grief?" Kessler answered, yes, and we're feeling a number of different griefs. We feel the world has changed, and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way, and we realize things will be different. Just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11, things will change, and this is the point at which they changed. The loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection. This is hitting us, and we're grieving collectively. We are not used to this kind of collective grief in the air. We're also feeling anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief is that feeling we get about what the future holds when we're uncertain. Usually it centers on death. We feel it when someone gets a dire diagnosis or when we have the normal thought that we'll lose a parent someday. Anticipatory grief is also more broadly imagined futures. There is a storm coming. There's something bad out there. With a virus, this kind of grief is so confusing for people. Our, our primitive mind knows something bad is happening, but you can't see it. This breaks our sense of safety. We're feeling, we're feeling that loss of safety right now. I don't think we've collectively lost our sense of general safety like this. Individually or as smaller groups, people have felt this, but all together, this is new. We're grieving on both a micro and a macro level. Then he goes into the stages of grief, you know, and, and uh, Connor Gwynn has written for us perceptively on this uh, for Mockingbird, but he, he, uh, Kessler is, tries to say that the stages of grief are not supposed to be linear or a ladder to climb. They, they, they may not happen in particular order, but he goes through how they look right now. There's denial, which we say a lot of early on, that this virus won't affect us. Then there's anger. You're making me stay home and taking away my activities. Then there's bargaining. Okay, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? Then there's sadness. I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed. Acceptance, as you might imagine, is where the power lies. We find control in acceptance. I can wash my hands. I can keep a safe distance. I can learn how to work virtually. But Kessler goes on. He says there's another stage that he's trying to introduce and that the Kubler-Ross family has actually given him permission to introduce, which is finding meaning, meaning being that sort of sixth Hmm. stage. He said, I had talked to Elizabeth quite a bit about what came after acceptance. I did not want to stop at acceptance when I experienced some personal grief. I wanted meaning in those darkest hours. And I do believe we find light in those times. Even now, people are realizing they can connect through technology. They are not as remote as they thought. They are realizing they can use their phones for long conversations. They're appreciating walks. I believe we will continue to find meaning now and when this is over. You guys finding any meaning or grief or you sense that uh, collective grief in the air or, or what? what? What do you think of this? 
Um, I'm preaching about this this Sunday. So it was interesting um, to see this article going around a lot because what I'm seeing patterns of, so I've got a, we've got a zoom group for like, I don't know, young moms at our church, basically. Like if you've got a kid at home, you can be in the group. Um, And so we meet once a week and basically just have a glass of wine and cry Mm -hmm. together. Um, And then we've got, you know, I'm seeing neighbors out and I'm seeing people post on social media, this, this thing of like, well, I don't, it's not as bad for me as it is for other people. We need to be thinking about these other people over here. You know, Mm -hmm. have you thought about these other people and how they're dealing with it? I've heard so many people in my neighborhood say, like, they'll list off their problems. A really good friend of mine who's trying Ooh. to sell her house and <laughs> owns two houses right now and, you know, was like, you know, but it's just a first world problem. Mm. And I um, I hate that phrase because I was like, it's still a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, even if you, like, put a dress on it, it's still a problem. Um, and I really am trying to encourage people this Sunday and I, you know, I, I would really encourage anyone who's listening to this, who's preaching this Sunday, to think about the the kind of the specificity of God's concern and and sadness at the death of Lazarus, and also at the specificity by which He calls Lazarus from the tomb. Like He says His name, and if you don't listen to Same Old Song, which is our preaching podcast, I highly recommend it because. I can't remember if it was Jake or Aaron, but somebody made the great point that like part of the reason that Jesus had to call, like had to say Lazarus's name was because if he hadn't, it was a tomb and like all kinds of dead family members would have walked out. <laughs> and so there's something really beautiful to me about, you know, we can't, we can't deny our, our sadness, deny our grief, which I think a lot of us are doing, right? Because it makes us feel like we're in control over it. But we can't, we can't deny it without in some way denying making meaning out of this in some way denying jesus right like our helper our Mm. healer so i i i'm pretty i love that this has been shared kind of across so many platforms in my life because i think we're all really living in this place of like kind of denying our grief um i'm sad i mean i'm really sad i was supposed to see dolly parton at the end of april (laughs) like I know you're laughing, but my throat closes up every time I say that because seeing her is like seeing my grandmother and that's all I want right now. So like, it's like, it's really sad. And like our kids are like having a good time, but also like every time one of my kids face FaceTimes with their friends, they're really sad afterwards because there's a sense of like loss. So I, I'm thankful that we're having these conversations about the stages of grief. The only complaint I have is like, I really wish they were linear. <laughs> <laughs> just c- complaining to God or the universe. That- <laughs> like, yeah. I just, I, I, yeah, I, it's so funny. Every time we talk about these stages of grief, whoever's writing about it, it's always like, but it's not linear. I'm like, I just want one person to be like, it's totally linear. You can expect <laughs> the first one, then the second one, then the third one, then you're done. You know, <laughs> like it's not how it works. So, I don't, I'm trying to figure out how I'm feeling. I don't know if I'm grieving. I, I think I, unsettled for sure. And I think whenever I've noticed my, in myself a pattern that whenever I'm undergoing some sort of big transition, it takes me a day or two to kind of wrap my head around it. And, and I'm unsettled and I'm anxious and I am praying and I feel a little paralyzed. But then after a couple mm. days, you know, by God's grace or whatever, I find myself able to move um, forward, and um, as you said, Sarah, like I've, I've been having um, really good moments of connection with my parish, and and yesterday was such a gift because I, you know, like a lot of other pastors and preachers out there, have just been doing everything we can to try to connect with our people in the midst of this new normal, and wondering, you know, we're putting all this stuff out into cyberspace on top of the phone calls we're making, the emails we're making, all that sort of stuff, and wondering, like, is it having Mm -hmm. any impact at all? And then I got, like, four emails in a row yesterday morning from people being like, thank you so much. We feel so connected. A couple of of them even said, we feel more, Mm -hmm. in some ways, we feel more connected than we felt before. Um, And so that was really hopeful. And I would encourage those of you listening who are, who attend church and are not uh, pastor types, 
write your pastors and priests a note, an email of encouragement or, or, or call them on the phone or something, because that kind of stuff, especially in these moments, they're, they're like gold, you know, and they're like oxygen. They're like energy. Um, but now I don't, I don't know exactly how I'm feeling. It, I'm glad my family is together. I'm glad for the time I'm getting with them. I'm glad for a little bit more quiet, um, it is one of these moments where, you know, Jesus talks about every day having enough trouble of its own. And I feel like I'm living right in the middle of that. And there's some freedom to that, you know, we're all just, we talked about this last episode, we're all just kind of doing the best we can. And it's lifted a little bit of the pressure mm-hmm. off. Uh, and it also just does feel like a slightly more human and compassionate moment. You know, for the first time in a long time, people on social media are starting to be like, maybe we could give politicians in our life a little bit of a break, you know, whether they're on the left or the right, like maybe everyone's just kind of doing the best yeah. they can. I don't know if I'm feeling sad or bargaining necessarily. I'm kind of like, well, here we are. Let's do this. Yeah. I'm I'm so glad to hear that though, RJ, because you've really been in my prayers just because like, it has been like job transition. You're, you know, there's, there's a whole parish in Florida. There's a house, you know, house in Florida. You've got a kid who's a senior in high school you like, I'm so thankful that you're such a sweet dad and like really take joy in Marshall because like having a kid Marshall's age in this situation right now sounds like a nightmare. Well, let me say this <laughs> three months ago, it would have been a nightmare, but he's, you know, okay. my experience that kid, kids his age have about three to six months of good, three to six months of bad. And it kind of goes back and forth, but he's in a very yeah. sweet moment at present. So Praise good. the Praise Lord. God. He's sleeping yeah, well. So he's good. happy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. He's so they're also a little bit like I hadn't thought about it, but everyone puts up these like things about how this is like the best time for dogs, right? Because their people never leave, but it's also probably the best time for toddlers. Too. Absolutely, you know what I mean? Yes. Like yeah. Annie, Annie, who's not a toddler but is five, drew a picture yesterday and put it on my nightstand that said, "Love is being together," and it was all the members of our family, yes. including the goldfish. And I was like, "Oh my god, this is like." You know, this may be hard for a lot of people, but this is like a really beautiful time for you on some level. He's spending a lot less time in the car than he usually does. And I think he's very happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I was trying to think about how, um, you know, our three-year-old is very excited to have his brothers at home. Mm. There's no question about it. And yet, you know, one of the things that you sort of getting at, Sarah, and what you said was that people are constantly trying to minimize. They're managing their pain and their grief by trying to minimize it by saying, well, at least I'm not that person. At least I'm not mm-hmm. this person. And that can get very tiresome. I mean, I think it's a very human reflex. And one of the ways we do that is like, well, I'm so privileged and I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not like this person. But one of the ways in which I, I genuinely do feel privileged, and that, that word has taken on such a, a kind of a shut up <laughs> vibe. <laughs> uh, I, but... In the fact that I am surrounded by family mm. and I'm not, yeah. I'm not alone. And one of the, yeah. one of the, the, the definitely like one of the things I'm actually really appreciating about the coronavirus is that it's such a, uh, it's so flattening and to, to use that word that's out there all mm. the time. It, it touches on everyone. It doesn't really care and, and about your status or what have mm-hmm. you. Um, but it does seem to you, people are affected differently if they're completely alone. And that was that's where my heart goes out, and that's where the, like, I think a lot of people who are completely on their own, I think for a while it's fun, and then it, then it gets not fun. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, we're, we're, there's a couple of articles, actually a bunch of articles that have come out this week about loneliness and social distancing and social isolation being really, you know, up until 10 days ago, these were things that were seen as terrible, not just like mm. they're, they're seen as actively awful because of the epidemic of loneliness that we have in our country already. I remember when I talked to uh, Melina Smith, uh, our wonderful Melina, who's just put a great devotional on our website today. And she was saying like, Americans sort of already social distance in the sense that they, they're, she's coming from a, a Mexican background and people are all over each other, at least that, the way she's talked about it. And Italy, you know, they're, they're living on top of each other because they're so much more affectionate. Hmm. Uh, and um, but Ezra Klein and Vox was saying this. This is just one of many articles about this. He says it's this coronavirus is also going to cause what we might call a social recession, a collapse in social contact that is particularly hard on the populations most vulnerable to isolation and loneliness: older adults and people with disabilities or pre-existing health conditions. The researchers found that even before the coronavirus, about a quarter of older adults fit the definition of socially isolated. 
And 43% said they felt lonely. Now, you can be one without the other, but both conditions seem to inflict harm on physical and mental health. Social isolation has been associated with a significantly increased risk of premature mortality from all causes, a recent report found, including a 50% increased risk of developing dementia. Um, he, one of the things he recommends in that article is the hardest hit populations are often the least technologically savvy. So one simple way to help may be just to act as tech support for the people in your life who aren't technologically savvy. The, the eternally put upon younger person in a family who's always called in to be the IT support, and even if they're terrible at technology, right now there's a bit of a nobility to that. And hmm. like, you know, you can actually serve your grandparent or those in your church who just, just stink at technology. And I, frankly, one of the things that this coronavirus is dragging so many people onto the internet. You, we thought everyone was already on there, but it turns out they weren't. Anyway, loneliness. Uh, I want to read another article about it. But before we do, I just want to say I'm grateful that I, in the midst of everything else that's happening, the uncertainty, the anxiety, the fear, I'm not lonely. I'm, hmm. I'm, if anything, I, I, I could stand to sometimes be a little, be a little bit more lonely. Time, yes. <laughs> I had the exact uh, same. I'm not sitting around reading the great works of Western, you know, the canon yeah. or something like that. I'm, I had the same experience. I'm actively corralling children. Sorry. That's right. The other night when finally, like, the kids were to bed and my wife and I spent, like, half an hour, like, doing the dishes, cleaning the house, getting our living room in some semblance of, of normalcy and, like, sat down to watch an HBO show for an hour together. We're like... Yes, this is what we needed because it's been uh, it's been controlled chaos. And Dave, I love what you say about serving as the uh, impromptu IT director for older people in your life. But I'll also say, just calling them on the phone, you know, can be a huge uh, you know ministry as well. Like not just aiding them to use Zoom or Facebook or whatever it is, but just spending time with people on the phone. And uh, I found that in in our in our congregation, you know, it's it's well known those parishioners who are isolated, they're older, they live, they live by themselves, they don't have a smartphone, they're not great with technology. And I've been really blown away by how proactive our people have been to call those people and check in on them on a regular, sometimes daily basis, just to say, hey, how are you? Um, and so to see uh, acts of service like that has been really, really encouraging. Sarah, what do you think? I mean, I I don't know. I Sure. I think it's good for us to reach out to these people and help them with technology. And certainly I've seen a lot of churches that are doing that kind of stuff. I also just think, you know, I I just want to encourage everyone to think more specifically to their neighborhood. Um, it's interesting in Christianity, we always talk about like loving your neighbor or, you know, like invite your neighbor to church or whatever. And at least in my iteration of like liberal uh, often wishy-washy Christianity, uh, what that means is go downtown and serve the homeless population, mm -hmm. which is fine. But you've got an 80-year-old woman in your neighborhood right now who's isolated. Mm -hmm. And so when you want to think about loving your neighbor, like we've got a lady across the street from us who is older, who can't leave her house and like won't even kind of, she has this little gate outside and she won't really step beyond that into the driveway right now. And I'm out on the front porch a lot. And like, so on a daily basis, I'm like, hey, Claire, how's it going? You know, <laughs> like, it's like those, like your actual neighbors is actually who you're called to take care of right now. And I think for a lot of us, that's not a thing we've ever done before. But I think we need to be thinking more that way. Um, one sweet thing I've seen in our neighborhood that I have like loved is people are like writing notes to their neighbors on their mm. driveway. Mm. Um which is really beautiful. And like, there's a kid in the neighborhood who had a birthday. And so people put up signs in their yards and like, I, I don't know. I just think, I think the technology stuff is really helpful for people. And I think that, that there's a lot of valor there, but I also, I think the specific and Dave, I had a conversation with you when this started where I said, this is going to get more and more specific and it, and it, and it has. And so the way that we love people has to get more and more specific. And honestly, you know, we live in a global context where we know the worst thing that's happening to anyone at any given moment. And so it's very easy for us to minimize our suffering and even minimize the suffering of people in our own neighborhoods because we're like, well, so and so and such and such country is I mean, like somebody is always having a harder time than you are. And it's probably on CNN right now, you know. And so I think 
kind of shutting some of that off and saying like, who is in my neighborhood that needs something? Who is in my neighborhood that needs a word of encouragement? Um, I think that's kind of the best way we can help, especially our elderly, especially our lonely, especially people who live by themselves right now. So, yeah. It's very convicting to think about your actual neighbor, not actual, neighbor. not the sort of Mr. Rogers sense. Like who is your, not, think not about the, the pers- person you get to have a benevolent relationship with where you get to be above them. Right? Not that person. We're talking about the but, person who always is like kind of cleaning up your stuff right before you're about to and it drives you crazy because you right. make such a judgment or yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the people that in it, like anytime we throw stuff away that maybe shouldn't be thrown away, make a comment about landfills and things like that. And you just yeah. want to be like, <laughs> ah! those are your people now. Those you are know the what I mean? People. It turns out they, they always have been. Yeah. It's just they're really your people now. You know? <laughs> trust me, they're around. They're, also, they're, yeah. they're not doing anything. <laughs> They're kind of, they're actually watching you right now. double down on our Zoll neighborhood. Are they throwing the right things away program? (laughs) I know. They're, 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 they're paying attention, shall we say. We got a flow chart. Yeah. When are they going to get that bouncy castle out of their front yard? Exactly. (laughs) Never. We're going to get kudzu. (laughs) RJ, how about you, man? What are you thinking? No, I, I totally agree. And we have quite a few older people in our um, neighborhood who we do kind of know. We don't spend a lot of time together. But um, even the other day, uh, my Marshall, again, wanted to go climb uh, one of our neighbor's trees because it's a really cool tree. And we've been learning about trees as we sit in the yard and, and uh, you know talk about varietals. And so we walked over and knocked on uh, knocked on Jack's door and he actually shook both of our hands. He reached out and shook our hands. So we climbed the tree and then I was like, Marshall, we need to go home right now and wash our hands. <laughs> so we so <laughs> he, he ran away screaming. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, I was so taken aback. I was like, oh but hey God, man. Well it's also hard to be to be dating during this time. I think that this is not uh, exactly our stage of life right now. But I mean, there was thank God. There was an article in Mother Jones by Julie uh, Julia Lurie uh, called uh, Apocalyptic Booty Calls and the Meaning of Loneliness in the Time of Coronavirus. How exactly does one date during a pandemic? The cringingly topical pickup line seems to be a popular way to start. I recently got a message reading, if coronavirus doesn't take you out, can I? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, Andy. I literally read that and had to hear some. I was like, I don't get it. And then you just read it. And I was like, oh, mm. like that's out of the dating game I am. A colleague of hers received... <laughs> I don't know what's more attractive, your killer dance moves or the idea of weathering the apocalypse together. Um, (laughs) uh, Back to humor again. It all starts to feel like an exhausting exercise in ignoring the loneliness tucked away in a dark corner. Uh, After all, who really wants to acknowledge that it'd be nice to have a little company? Well, now it appears everyone does. The paradoxical silver lining of extreme social distancing is that it seems to have given people, single or not, license to talk freely about loneliness. A bright light switched on, the shadows giving way to the real deal. News outlets like Vox, like the Wall Street Journal, like the New York Times, have published long pieces over the past week about the psychological costs of loneliness. Politicians and celebrities, from Andrew Cuomo to Lizzo, are talking about the toll of isolation, too. I do hope that when this is all over, I don't kick the loneliness that's left to its usual spot in the dark corner. There's something empowering about dragging it out for all to see and watching others doing the same. When I see Linda Holmes, the host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour, tweet, Good morning! Special fist bump to people like me who live alone when it comes to humans. It's not forever. You're doing great. I want to scream, You too, Linda. You too. Um... This anything that kind of destigmatizes loneliness as a topic, well, at least that that can be one of the many silver linings that we're experiencing. I don't want to um, get overly bright on all this stuff, but is anything? I mean, uh, dating in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, what do you guys think about all that, or just talking about loneliness in general? I mean, I have a friend who um, it's funny is like dating a couple different people and um and he's still trying to practice the social distancing when they're around each other which just makes me laugh so like it's very chase you know but like you have people over and like you still have to like have six feet of distance between the two of you I mean I think it's a weird time to try to date but then I could also see people really turning the internet in earnest right now right because it's like 
what else are you going to do? Um, but then, like, I wonder, I mean, so much of our communication is what we're doing right now, which we're used to with the podcast. But, um, like, I had therapy this past week. And um, and we did teletherapy, right? So we did it like this. We could see the screen and stuff. And it was very interesting. She talked a little bit more than she usually talks. She doesn't talk much about herself. Mm -hmm. But she's got kids like I have kids, so she referenced that. And it felt a little bit more, like, sherry than it usually feels. And I was like, I wonder if it'll be weird when we get back to meeting in person. Like, it's just such an interesting thing to, like, be in relationships in this way right now. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I... I do. This article started with her like having a basically a one night stand with a guy that she apparently. I mean, I don't know if you call them like what do you call those like sixteen night stands? Just somebody you can friends call, with a benefits call is what it's called. Yeah. Yes, and like having one with him right before this started, and I'm just like, I, I mean, I guess like good for you, but like I just it's like how to make weird stuff weirder. I don't know, you know, like yeah, I can't judge. I'm married thirteen years. It's just like ugh, well, that was yeah, that was my. I mean, speaking of someone who hasn't dated since the mid to late 90s you know i can't necessarily opine on this but my understanding from people that are living in metropolitan areas uh that in spite of the ability to connect physically through all of these various apps and and social media platforms like you know bumble and tinder and hinge i even heard of hinge that was a new one she was uh that was mentioned in one of the articles we read that it's very easy to hook up with somebody, but that do, it's no cure for the loneliness. And in some ways, it just has served to highlight the loneliness, right? The lack of emotional connection between people. You know, it's very easy to physically connect, but much more difficult to emotionally um, connect. And I had a weird thought as I was reading this. You know, as I said a couple weeks ago, one of the commitments I made to myself is that my wife and I would watch The Bachelor. You know, we'd catch up on The Bachelor during our time of um, social isolation, which we've done. And uh, this last season was interesting because it was pretty clear that Peter The Bachelor was in love with this one girl, uh, Madison. But then Madison made this request of him, like, hey, if we're going to do this, like, don't sleep with the, those other girls. Like, please oh, don't, you know, I, like I, I'm not going to sleep with anyone. And I, I don't know how you'd expect me to um, say yes to a marriage proposal a week from now when I know that you've just slept with a couple other contestants. Um, and of course, he went ahead and did it anyway. But I just thought to myself, if he if he'd been if they'd been living through the coronavirus and there had been social distancing, he and Madison might have actually worked out, you know, right. but it was just the ease with which. Um, he could physically connect with these other contestants that led to the breakdown in their in their relationship. So I don't know. It's a little bit self righteous. I feel a little self righteous saying this, but you know, my my wife and I, when we were dating, spent a year apart. When I was doing a year abroad and she was back in the states, we were both in college, and we just had to talk on the phone like once a week because it was so expensive. And then we would write emails back then, which thank God email had just come out. But I don't think we'd be married now if we hadn't spent that year apart, actually. And so maybe, paradoxically, the inability to physically, physically connect will force people to emotionally connect in a way that they didn't before. I, I don't think that it could be a bad thing to clarify people's priorities ever. Uh, and that this is asking these questions. It's asking. It's it's forcing people to ask moral questions. And it's and 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 like, is this is this a person? Okay, I like this this person, but are they are they quarantine like? You know, are they? It's just <laughs> yeah, exactly. your Seinfeld yeah. in there. But I, I think the fact that it's brought reality closer to the surface and forced people to stop in order to you know, deal with some of like the larger questions of like. Is this where I want to put my time? Does it does it matter enough within the within the pressure cooker of a pandemic? Uh, should it should it really matter even in, when it's not a pandemic? I don't know. I I, I can't help but see that as a kind of a relief because mm. so much of it's, our distractions are what are driving us crazy. It's deeply clarifying. I mean, it's already been like clarifying for me in terms of relationships because it's like. There are certain people that, like, I know I can, like, engage this situation with, and there are certain people that I can't. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's, like, that, like, that is, because, especially because, like, you know, you guys, it's like, we've got kids at home. I mean, I'm, like, busier than I've ever been just trying to, like, you know, 
help somebody learn how to do like long division. And so like, I, I don't, I think it's very clarifying for relationships. Cause you're just like, okay, well who, who do I actually want to spend time with? You know, cause I have precious little of it. So yeah. And I've, I've had the experience in the last week of being getting called by, you know, good friends that I don't, I'm not on like text, uh, you know, kind of text friendship with right now mm-hmm. just from, from the past and really wow. catching up in these long ways. And I find that to be yeah. a, yet another amazing, beautiful thing. Now I'm going to read a, a little passage from an article that appeared in The Point by Justin E.H. Smith called It's All Just Beginning. Now he, he goes through outlining, you know, as all of these essays are going to do, you have to basically catalog the horror of it um, as, as by way of qualification before getting on to what you kind of really want to say, which is that you're sort of enjoying what's happening. Um, hmm. And this is what he says. He says, I, am, I find that I am generally at peace and that the balance between happiness and sadness on any given day is little different from what it has always been for me. I find that there is liberation in the suspension of more or less everything. In spite of it all, we are free now. Any fashion, sensibility, ideology, set of priorities, worldview, or hobby that you acquired prior to March 2020 and may have by then started to seem to you cumbersome, dull, inauthentic, a drag, you are no longer beholden to it. You can cast it off entirely and no one will care. Likely no one will notice. Were you doing something out of mere habit, conceiving your life in a way that seemed false to you? Well, you can stop doing that now. We have little idea what the world is going to look like when we get through to the other side of this, but it is already perfectly clear that the quote-unquote discourses of our society, such as they had developed up until March 8th or 9th, 2020, in all their frivolity and distractiousness, have been decisively curtailed, like the CO2 emissions from the closed factories and the vacated highways. Mm. Not to downplay the current tragedy, as I've already acknowledged, it has already affected me personally in deep and real ways. But I take it that this interruption is a good thing. Now, this is kind of the truth that dare not speak its name a little bit right now. And he says it in, a, I think, a very um, trenchant way. Um, this is such a large thing that it's not going to be just one thing and not another. But when you do read that in China, people can see the sun for the first time in ages because the factories have stopped producing all the smog, you think um, maybe... Maybe there's something good about this in, in terms of clarifying people's priorities. I can't help but think of the the, the basically batshit uh, religious discourse in this country and the, the deconstructions and the deconversions and the, 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 the everyone policing each other's ethics and causes and stuff like that. So much A little of less it. policing going on. <laughs> Thank De- God. Death, just death as, as the great equalizer just puts it all into kind of – it, it, it into perspective, I guess, and it also highlights what's really important, which are our relationships, which is God, which is death itself, and and the, the the shout from outside the tomb of "Come out, Lazarus!" You know, if that shouts there, I need to know about it right now. Mm. Um, right. And that's exciting to me. I feel guilty about saying it. Uh, it's only mildly guilty about saying it. Maybe talk to me next week and. You know, I might know two or three people who are in the hospital, mm. and I'll, I will say, take back everything I've said. But for the time being, I'd be dishonest not to allow that. I kind of believe this reset that Justin Smith is 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 uh, is, is alluding to um, is kind of cool. I I mean, I remember you know, and I wrote a bit about my grandmother's this week for the website. But I remember growing up, both my grandmothers told stories about the depression, but. Asked one of them, because they were super poor, one of them in particular who was one of seven children was super poor. And I said, like, what was it like to grow up poor? And she said, well, Sarah, everybody was poor. So we know the difference. And it, it is this interesting thing to me that this is this great equalizer in a, in a culture where, you know, nothing is equal. Um, It's, I just I think it's going to ask different and weird things of of all of our institutions. It's certainly going to ask different and weird things of our churches. Um, I think it's going to ask really interesting and different things from the kind of sermons that we preach in mainline Protestantism. Um, I, I you know, and I'm I'm kind of excited for that, which is you know maybe not what people want to hear, and I get that. Look, I mean. We know the reality. We're, I mean, my husband and I are literally watching Italy. We're watching these stories about how their coffins stacked up and how the government's paying to 
to um to have people cremated and 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 that we're i mean we've given up sabbatical this summer yeah. because we're anticipating that we're gonna have to deal with some of that like we're but but dave what i want to say to you is i think i think we can hold those two things together yeah i can also find great joy in the fact that i get to be with my kids this much i mean i've had moments where i'm like this is kind of what i thought sabbatical was gonna feel like you know like we're all together it's good down time now, my sweet husband is running around like a, you know, chicken with his head cut off trying to get things done. But for the rest of us, there's a lot of rest we're finding right now. And I think it's perfectly okay. In fact, I think it is 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 in some ways deeply Christian to say, yes, all these horrible things are happening. But also there is this, you know this hopefulness in the midst of it yeah. and, and that that's, and that that's okay. And, and that hopeful change might come out of this and that that's okay. Um, you know, if this makes people kinder and, um, if this makes people more connected in their relationships to their family, then, then these people will not have died in vain. Right. I mean, then, then, then there, there will be, there will be something good to come out of it. And I, I you know, I, I, I think we could spend the next however long we do these, you know, more quarantine specific episodes kind of apologizing for, you know, seeing the goodness in this. But, you know, it's like, it, I mean, I think it frames this whole conversation we're having. I think this frames the podcast, that quote from Stephen Colbert, like what, you know, what punishments of God are not also gifts. I mean, I think that's, that's where we are. Yeah, and Dave, as you were talking, it just occurred to me that what it's felt like the past few years in America is that it's been living life as though death is not part of life, as if everything totally. is infinitely totally. optimizable. Um, and now we're living life as if death is a part of it, and it's not something separate or alien. Yes. It is part of life. It's, it's living life in light of death which sounds terrible but it actually there's some there's some freedom in that uh and as you know Sarah you were talking about preaching this Sunday it is a story of Lazarus it's also um the great passage from Ezekiel you know the breathing the breath um pr- you know to, into the dry bones and and bringing them back to life and it and there is something about you know before God can bring us back to life we have to be dead we have to acknowledge death and and um that's more what it feels like to me that God is breathing life into what was dead because we were dead. We were dead before when we were living life as if death was not a thing. We were just in massive denial of it. And now it's like, no, no, we can't deny this thing anymore. And now that we can't deny it, we need to admit the truth of our situation. Maybe God can actually breathe some new life into us individually and collectively. Um, no, that's 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 beautiful. Uh, Andrew Sullivan put it kind of lyrically, I thought, in his essay uh, in the New York Magazine called "How to Survive a Plague," um, and he was talking about what it was like to sort of be in New York in the '80s during the AIDS epidemic and sort of uh, and the, those lessons that were learned. Um, but he he says this. He, he talking about coronavirus. He says, "Good will happen too. Surely it will." The silence in the streets pretends something new. The other day, I realized I'd been texting a lot less and calling a lot more. I wanted to make sure my friends and family were okay, and I needed to see their faces and hear their voices to be reassured. As we withdraw from each other in the flesh, we may begin to appreciate better what we had until so recently. Friendship and love made manifest by being together. Simple gifts, like a head resting on your shoulder, a hand squeezed, a toast raised. And in this sudden stop, we will also hear the sounds of nature. As our economic machine pauses for a moment and the contest for status or fame or money is canceled for just a while. All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone, Hmm. Pascal said. Well, we'll be able to test that now, (laughs) won't we? (laughs) These weeks of confinement can be seen also, it seems to me, as weeks of a national retreat. A chance to reset and rethink our lives, to ponder their fragility. I learned one thing in my 20s and 30s in the AIDS epidemic. Living in a plague is just an intensified way of living. It merely unveils the radical uncertainty of life that is already here and puts it into far sharper focus. We we will all die one day, and we will almost all get sick at some point in our lives. None of this makes sense on its own, especially the dying part. 
The trick, as the great religions teach us, is counterintuitive, not to seize control, but to gain some balance and even serenity in absorbing what you can't. Mm. Uh, I think that's... Uh, convicting and true. Convicting. Comforting. And, uh, yeah, uh, maybe the sort of thing we would say the week before all hell breaks loose, but... <laughs> I mean, all hell's breaking loose, right? It's just not... Yeah, it's... We're in it, but the, the great thing about... Um, the great thing about hell. <laughs> Tell us, Sarah. <laughs> the great thing about hell uh, is we're not stuck there. Do you know what I mean? That's the great thing about hell is that we're not stuck there. And the great thing about hell is it gives us a really sharp and refining contrast as to the things in our lives that are just not ducking worth it. And I think seeing goodness in the midst of this is is in some ways what is going to save us. Mm. Um, so, um, I hope that I'll continue to see this stuff. I mean, I hope, I hope people continue to like propose marriage and people continue to make babies and people like, I, you know, I hope for the goodness in the midst of this. I don't know. I mean, I think we're, I think we're already there. Yeah. It's going to get worse. It's going to get scarier. It's going to get more intensified, but like, I'm already stuck at home. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we're, we're kind of where we are right now, uh, for the foreseeable future, um, but sometimes I think that the life of a in ministry, and this is also true of life more generally, but particularly when you have to get up there in a pulpit and try to say something uh, a true and of comfort to people, is already an intensified way of living because you're constantly oh, yeah. confronted with death. And um, it can be exhausting. You can want to just get on the treadmill of distraction and you know never look back. And yet I feel like with the rest of the world kind of joining us in that, I feel less alone. And that everyone's thinking about life and death and so many of the uh, non-issues that we thought were so important have, have faded. I mean, isn't it funny how no one's no one cares about the Democratic primary all of a sudden? Yeah. I know, it's I really mean, interesting. I, I, I find it like yeah. Yeah, we can say till we're blue in the face that politics is important, but it's not actually the main thing going on in life. But then something like this happens and death, which is, and life and death, which is the main thing happening in life, casts everything else into kind of a people still care but not primary it, it's not primary and whenever we're in the realm of the primary things we're in the realm of reality and that's where god is and um so again i i'm 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 with sullivan on all this the intensified way of living yes it might get we might need all need to take a lot of naps but it sounds like we're going to have the time to do that. Yeah, a buddy so, of mine said, he's like, I just feel like we're all uh, catching up on the sleep we've been missing for the last decade or whatever it is. Like, we're all going to come out of this hopefully pretty well rested, as long as we don't wake up at 3 a.m. with, you know, uh, fears hanging over. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm definitely which I'm, doing that too. But part of that's my fault because I'm watching Tiger King. So, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> okay. I haven't but watched Dave, that you, yet. As I'm you dying to. Day, you're going to be so much dumber Dave, afterwards. <laughs> okay, keep going, RJ. <laughs> <laughs> David reminded me of something your um, brother Simeon said to me when we were leading that guy. Uh, uh, that guy. That guy. The, 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 you know, Who? he's almost yeah, he's almost like a brother to you. I know. Um, oh my God, it's the best joke. I think about it every it's time. So about, good. Was it John who introduced him? Who said he's a friend of the family or <laughs> something? Friends. He's more like a he's like a close family friend. <laughs> it's so terrible. Oh my God. But I was leading. He, and he's the best of the Zolls. He and to be I were clear. both okay, leading a, a youth um, ski camp, probably like, gosh, eh, 15 years ago or something. And I was thinking about seminary and because I hadn't gone yet. And I, I sort of, you know, we were leading a small group together and I offhandedly um, kind of said, you know, well, and maybe I'll go to seminary, but maybe I'll quit this ministry thing and go get a real job. And Simeon said, RJ, like, what could be more real than what you're doing right now? You know, is 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 uh, I don't know. Is dealing with numbers or business or and, and not that I don't believe in the priesthood of all believers, right? I do deeply believe in that. That we're all called to different things, but um, what we're all going through right now is more real than anything could ever possibly be. And all the other stuff we thought was real is not. It's ephemeral and and vanishing. And and Dave, I think you're right that um, we in ministry are just are are privileged that. Or privileged or cursed both ways that this is closer to what our, our life usually looks like because there are people dying all the time like I, I go to the hospital every sure. week you know there are people falling like flies yeah. and um and it's just that most of the world has been going about its business forgetting about the reality of death and suffering and now they're being woken up to it 
um, and, and, and finding some of the pain, but also discovering some of the joy and their freedom that there is in engaging with uh, day-to-day real life. Yeah, I, it's funny. I keep thinking about something. Is John the one that said the thing about where God's office yes, is? Yes, genius. Yes, John. I keep thinking about that. I like looked it up because I was like, is that John that said that 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 um that God's office is found at the end of your rope? And I keep I like I keep thinking, I think this might be what the end of the rope feels like for everyone. Mm. So Well, let's close by talking a little bit about uh, the impossible because we're all sort of living with that right now. This is an article that appeared in the Covenant blog by Jonathan Michigan, who had spoke at one of our events a while ago, called "The Annunciation and the Impossible." This is, um, you know, normally in Lenten, in the in the in the non-Corona years, uh, there's the Feast of the Annunciation in, in the Episcopal Church, and this is what he writes. He says the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her a series of impossible-seeming things. He announced that she would conceive a child who would be the son of God. This would have seemed impossible to her for a variety of reasons. The whole idea that God could take human flesh would have sounded like something out of science fiction to her. That it could happen while she was still a virgin? Impossible. And almost as impossible as what the angel said next, that Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who was clearly too old to have children, was pregnant with John the Baptist. All impossible. But the angel said, nothing will be impossible for God. Now, we know something about impossible right now, don't we? A couple of months ago, it would have seemed impossible that we'd be living like this, in the most prosperous and advanced nation in the history of the world, locked in our homes. We wouldn't have believed it. And yet here we are. The impossible has happened. Businesses are closed. Streets are empty. People are getting sick and dying. No one has any toilet paper. It's crazy, impossible, and yet here we are. It feels now like it's impossible that we'll ever come out on the other end of this. It may feel like it's impossible we'll ever find a cure or a treatment for this disease that's ravaging the world. It may feel like it's impossible that we'll ever get to leave our homes and see our family and friends again. It is easy to watch the news and think we're never going to get through this. It's impossible. Nothing will be impossible for God. Our God chose a young woman named Mary to become his mother in the tabernacle of his flesh. God did the impossible. He conquered the boundary that sin had built between himself and us. He conquered death on the cross and gives us new life through something as simple as water poured on our head. He can do the impossible. He will do the impossible. Nothing can separate us from his love, including this virus. It may keep us from gathering together to worship him, but it can't keep him from loving us. It can't stop him from healing our souls and ushering in his kingdom. The angel announced the impossible to to Mary. Today we proclaim the impossible to the world. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he will make all things new. Never thought we'd be talking about the Annunciation on the Mocking Cast, but uh, impossible. And yet here we are. Same. Sarah, you, you look like you're trying to bite your tongue right now. I mean, I'm glad people have these things. So that's good. I don't know. You know, like it's not a, the, these, it, it was interesting to me because suddenly like all over my feed, it was like, it's the Annunciation in the midst of all this shit. And I'm just like, okay. Like I'm Nine glad. Nine months till Christmas. I don't know. I, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I just, it, yes, God can do the impossible, but I think I need to hear that God is going to do the impossible for me. Mm. I don't know. I, I need to hear that right now. Um, which is that like, I wouldn't wake up randomly midweek unable to breathe because I was so anxious and couldn't figure out why. Mm. Like, I feel, you know, I mean, I this is like the the good and the bad of me having grown up in what was essentially a Baptist Episcopal church, but I feel really disconnected from this part of the church. It doesn't kind of like speak to me in the same way. I don't find my comfort there. I am grateful, and I truly mean this, um, and I hope people can hear it. I I am truly grateful that I have brothers and sisters that do find comfort there, Um, but I don't. Um, And I don't know. Maybe RJ does. It's just um, so I don't want to, like, take that away from anybody. And I know we have a lot of clergy listeners who, you know, the Annunciation is, like, you know, super exciting for them. But for me, it feels – it feels like we have to be, it feels like we have to explain who Jesus is over and over again to people right now. And anything more than that, anything that could complicate that, anything that could confuse that, this is not the space for that for me. 
Hmm. You know, when I talk about how we have to care for our neighbor, part of the reason we have to care for our neighbors is because our neighbors don't go to church. They don't know, really know who Jesus is. They don't really know who Christians are. Their their version of it is so maligned and so um, hateful and so judgmental and so crazy. And I think the more that we can just be very basic about who we are, I mean, that's just what speaks to me and what I think is speaking to people's pain who have no idea what the Annunciation is. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm glad he wrote this. I'm glad people take comfort there, but that's just not where I am. Was that too honest? No, I'm glad you said it. That's Sorry. definitely, I wasn't thinking of it, honestly. The reason what hit me was not so much sort of defending the, the virgin birth or sort of getting into Marian theology, which I also find pretty just foreign uh, to my sensibility. I just I think that we're at a point where uh, human answers have failed and they're not really mm. there's not much to grasp a hold of and to say that God is the God of the impossible not just mm-hmm. what we see out there that's possible God is the God of the impossible that is mm-hmm. um and and you know just as like the you know I also get the same the same comfort when I hear uh the law preached and uh you know the the disciples say well be perfect as your heavenly father or don't worry about anything how is that mm-hmm. possible and it's not mm-hmm. and jesus says it's not possible for man but mm-hmm. what is mm-hmm. but what is what is not possible for man is possible with god that there is a there is another uh there will be a new uh, another horizon uh beyond this that we and that it, it beyond what we think of currently as possible uh, so that's where the, the 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 basic, I think, very basic comfort that I got from this piece unexpectedly. Um, but I understand if you're if you're operating in a church system that's, and we are many of us where these we need to stop everything and think about a feast day. Like the world doesn't care about any of that stuff. Like that's that's window dressing. Let's talk about the the fact that I need a savior. I mean, that's just where I'm just super desperate right now. You know what I mean? And probably not like pious enough or maybe as well read enough or theological enough to appreciate these things. And I'm fine with that. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I've said before, I grew up in a church that had the same floor my public school had like, and that's what shaped me. So for me, I'm just like, I feel like I'm just a more desperate human being. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm sadder. So, well, D- Dave, as you were talking about just using that word impossible, I was just trying to think of all the moments that I've lived through that seemed impossible at the time, right? I think about um, the first Gulf War breaking out and me watching it on CNN, which there'd never been a live televised war, and then the falling of the Berlin Wall and 9 11 and. Um, Sandy Hook and um, mm. uh, the, the the housing yeah. crisis and did I say nine? I probably said nine eleven already. And this and Hurricane Harvey can can sixty inches of rain really fall in two days? Um, maybe the lesson is that life just continually surprises you, and that all these things that no one saw coming and could never happen, um, they seem to be happening over and over again. And I'm not that old, you know. I'm only forty. How old am I? Forty. Three, forty-four years old. Like, I'm old enough to not exactly remember how old I am. Uh, but then I do go back, and I know I've told the story before. But my my son asking me in the wake of Sandy Hook, "How could God let this happen?" and me saying, "I don't know, but what I do know is that when He showed up, He was good, and He was so mm-hmm. good that I can I can trust Him when I don't when impossible things are happening all around me, and and maybe." This is kind of what he's saying in the piece. You know, people want to say, come on, that's, give me a break. It's impossible that God came to earth. It's impossible that this guy, Jesus, was God. It's like, well, okay, if you want. But but um, to me, it seems like the most uh, likely thing, given who he was and how he lived and how he died and what happened afterwards. Um, so maybe we, if we can embrace all of the impossibility of events around us, we can ingra- embrace this other impossibility which seems to bring hope and comfort and peace and joy in the midst of all of life's other impossibilities. Um, because at the end of the day, that's, that's the, as you said, Sarah, that's, that's the only thing we can hang on to is things down here clearly are completely insane and chaotic and impossible and out of our control. Um, and I don't know what other option we have than to believe in um, someone who holds it all and who, who loves us. And even when we don't know what's going on, he does, and he knows what he's doing. Um, mm. So I, do, I yeah, I, I did find it on March 25th, you know, I'm doing these little video daily devotionals for my church. And I was like, oh yeah, we're nine months out from Christmas. That's so crazy. 
Um, and to look back, we actually, I looked at the passage from Isaiah, you know, when King Ahaz or Ahaz or whatever is, is looking for a sign, like, where is God? Where is God? And Isaiah is like, this is the sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, God with you. And that promise is not fulfilled for hundreds of years, but in the same way, that's the promise that this king was to hold on to, this future promise. We have sort of this past promise and this future promise, which it, I don't, it's bizarre, right? Because it isn't, it isn't right now, and yet it is right now. It's, um, it's, it's slightly disembodied, and yet it also, to me, feels incredibly hopeful that, that when God showed up and when he does, when he showed up in, in history, he was so good that we can't stop talking about him. And he, he said that he's still with us now, that same, that same Jesus. I mean, uh, W.H. Auden says that we who must die uh, demand a miracle. And that's where, where we're at. And that's miracle has been, is, is the miracle that, that Michigan was talking about. And I think that's what we have that we're, we're sort of circling around and it hopefully comes across through this podcast. I was struck by another quotation from Leslie Jameson, the writer, which I thought I'll close with here. She was in conversation with Jamie Quattro, another writer, a couple of years ago. And she said, uh, she was talking about faith and writing about faith. She said, faith also came to be trusting that there might be something on the other side of intention that felt less willed, more sublime. So much of that trust fall shows up in other parts of life, of course, showing up for another day of marriage, showing up for another day of writing, showing up for another day of parenting, feeling frustrated, cloistered, doubtful, but believing in the other side of all those feelings, believing in another horizon beyond what you can see. That's the impossibility so good. for which we are all living in right now. That That's what we have to hold on to is not to deny all what the feelings are or what the reality feels like, but that there might be something on the other side, the other side of intention. I think my takeaway from this is I can't listen to anyone talk about the Lord right now. If they're not also going to talk about how hard it is to be home with children. Hmm. Like if you're not going to include that in your thoughts, I can't hear it. You know what I mean? I talk to me in a year. I can maybe be more Anglo Catholic, but today if you're not talking about being home with babies, I mean, maybe I just need to be reading Jesus' mom blogs. That's my takeaway. But I, I need, I need that word. If you're gonna give me, girl, the wash word, your face. You know, <laughs> go on, girl, wash your face. No, don't be saying that. We got some mean letters about that one, RJ. Well, Woo! you know, that's all we got for this week, which is a lot. But a you lot. know, RJ, RJ mentioned last time uh, letters uh, to. We would love to hear from you during this time, especially. Yeah. You know, where, where virtual communication is really a lot of ways the best that we can do. So why not leverage this platform too? So you can email us, email us at info at mbird.com. That's M-B-I-R-D dot com. And we will try to respond to you, maybe read your letter or talk about, give us something you wouldn't want us to speak about. Can't make any promises, but we would love to hear from you. Uh, and uh, just, you know, what does it say? Be well and be safe and be observant. That's what, that's what Bob Dylan... Remember, you're going to die. <laughs> Remember, you are going to die. I think it was uh, though. Get in the pool; it's full of chlorine. <laughs> it was Bob Dylan today. Say, stay safe, stay observant, and may God be with you. Aww. Let's leave it at that. Talk to you soon, guys. Yeah, bye, right, bye, friends. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you for listening. Remember, you can find us on the web at www.mbird.com. And we'd always love to hear from you at info at mbird.com. Audio production for The Mockingcast is provided by the Narrativo Group. And if you like what you've heard, please do drop over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Until next time. Praise the Lord. Praise